Welcome to our inaugurational installment of AI Chats. Um, we are uh, Matthias Del Campo and Sandra Manninger, and this is a series we would like to discuss chat and gossip AI and AI-related topics. So our first guest uh, is Dr. Arthur Flexer, uh, who was a senior researcher at the OE or IFAI, the Austrian Institute of Artificial Intelligence, since 1993, and who just recently started a position at the Johannes Kepler University Linz as a senior researcher and project manager with the Institute of Computational Perception. Um, we, and specifically, I wanted to talk uh, to take off with Arthur Flexer because not only is he the first person I met around 1992 to study AI, but he also was responsible uh, for me and Matthias to meet in the first place. So, uh, <laughs> don't even remember that. <laughs> it's, true. It's, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> So um, now that we covered a bit about personal trivia, uh, let me start by asking Ati, what sparked your interest uh, pursuing a career in AI? Oh, I think I more or less sort of slipped into it as most people slip into their careers. So I, my main training actually is psychology. So I mm -hmm. started studying psychology back in the day and uh, while well, I was sort of disappointed to a certain extent and sort of also bored and then started to uh, study computer science at the technical university in parallel. And so, you know, started being interested in computers and all that and, you know, attended a couple of AI lectures that already in the late 80s existed in Austria. And sort of this is how I grew into this. And then I I finished my psychology degree, my PhD, uh, also finished, let's say, something like a bachelor in computer science. Actually, my official title from the technical university is academically certified data engineer, which I think is super cool. <laughs> it's, it sounds extremely nerdy. <laughs> So yeah, I just slipped into it and uh, already for my uh, master's thesis and my doctoral thesis in psychology, I was working with AI, building algorithms that analyze uh, data from the brain, basically, so. Awesome, very interesting. I think it's also uh, some uh, an interest that we three share. I think, why are you interested in computational design and with computers? And I think, I, I think uh, Arthur, you also introduced me to Douglas Adams, you know, so the science ah, fiction yeah. writer. So thank you for that. You know, thank you for me. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? Yeah. Thinking it's back, it had quite an influence on my upbringing, but it was really, I think, we share this interest in science so this, yeah. <laughs> this notion of uh, technology as something that can be inspirational, not only technical, but also something that inspires us to 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 uh, what we kind of project for future and and uh, uh, specifically for us, for Matthias and myself, probably the spatial conditions, but probably after for you also the the social context within you uh, 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 implementing these new technologies. So, uh, what? So, asking that, I, I know that you have been collaborated with many, many artists, also with institutes like the the um, University for Applied Arts in Vienna. How did that came into pass? And do you want to talk about uh, collaborations that you probably had uh, that you think are most imp important or pertinent to your work? Well, I think I had over let's say the last 20 years that I, I worked in AI past sort of my, my graduation. Uh, roughly, let's say the first 10 years or so, I was working in uh, neuroscience, uh, designing algorithms for analysis of brain signals. So I also did a, a postdoc at the uni uh, UC San Diego, and I was working, working for a long time in this sort of uh, uh, avenue doing stuff like uh, and analyzing cognitive evoked potentials but also doing work in sleep research trying to automatically 
stage, uh, the sleep stages. And uh, I then sort of, again, got a little bored with this. I think this is the, uh, <laughs> the returning routine for me that I change directions because, I mean, most people that build a career stick to the same thing for a very long time. And I think this is how you do it. But I, I kept, you know, sort of turning and turning. And then I, I turned my attention towards the analysis of music to a field that is called music information retrieval, um, where you would try to filter out any kind of information from music. Music can be audio, but it can also be the notated score or text about music, really anything. And you can try to get from this, what kind of music is it? What is What genre is it? Is it fast music, slow music? What's the rhythm? What instruments are playing and so forth? And all these things you can use for uh, automatically recommending music, building playlists and these kind of things. So the, all these services like Spotify or Pandora in the US, they're all powered by people that come from our field. So, and this is something I have done uh, for quite a while now. So how does the data look like when you're working in, in, in this, you know, when you uh, collaborate with different uh, uh, artists or? Well, it, it's, well, data in music is always a bit of a problem because there's rights holders. <laughs> 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 and um, actually there, there's, there's a lot of funny stories with this. So we had a, a really bright PhD student and he had it in his mind for his PhD. He wanted to, to bring up the, the algorithms that already existed so that they work for millions of songs for really huge databases for the music of the world. And that is like 10 years ago. So not many people were working on this. And at that time we had a, a collaboration with Bank and Olufsen, you know, the, the super prestigious hi-fi company. And they said, yeah, you know, we want to do this and we're, we're, we're sort of working together with these rights holders and very soon we will get so much music and then you can get it and analyze it for us. And he was waiting and he was getting impatient and he had the impression this will never happen. So what he did is he, he wrote a little program that grabbed the Amazon MP3 store and downloaded, you know, they have these 30 seconds. Well, over a couple of weeks, he downloaded like 3 million snippets from the from <laughs> plus all the meta information, which is not entirely legal. And he was sort of surprised that they didn't track him and didn't find out. But because of this, you know, we were the first ones being able to analyze like a really large <laughs> set of data, which then we could not share with anyone else because you know, the origin is sort of, as you say, in Austria, the data fell from the truck. Gives <laughs> 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 you an impression that this really is a problem. Mm -hmm. But you know, we also work together with uh, FM Fear, which you too know because you're also Austrians. It's sort mm -hmm. of an alternative radio station in Austria. And they very early on, like uh, since like since 2005, they had their own uh, sort of web space called the Sound Park, where up and coming uh, bands could upload their music sort of for free, and anybody could listen to it and download also for free. And a lot of people would do that in Austria because you would actually get the chance to be played on the real radio station. So, and a lot of uh, alternative bands started there. And we had a project together with FM Fear and implemented what was back then in 2008, the first content-based music recommendation system that was really out there in the world. Oh. So that there, there were a lot of sort of, well, there were a few sort of academic systems that would run on a small database somewhere, but this was something that anybody could interact with. And it's actually still running. It's, uh, yeah, it's still on. <laughs> <laughs> you have to uh, I give us the link so we can put it into the description box. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds amazing. 
So I, I um, have a quick question about the, the, the databases and the way how you're working with them, because it, it's one thing to get the data. The other one is, is, is it labeled or not? Did you have to go through everything and label yourself like these whole databases to make it work somehow? No, no. So this, this came with labels. I mean, the, uh, there's very coarse genre labels for this that the artists that upload the music give, you know, sort of, sort of uh, give to the data themselves. But it's actually, it's funny that you start talking about the labels because sort of lately I sort of turned my focus again. <laughs> so I'm, I'm still working in, in music information retrieval but these days, you know, everything is machine learning. Everybody's doing machine learning and there's a big hype about it. You are also working with machine learning in architecture and I'm now sort of focusing on what I call the dark side of machine learning. So I'm interested in anything that goes wrong. That's really is my interest because I've done this for such a long time now and I've seen a lot of really bad work. <laughs> And now that there's such a hype and everybody's coming in and very, very many people are coming in that don't really know a lot about it, there's more and more sort of bad things happening. And at the same time, it sort of permeates our everyday life and has like real repercussions and, you know, it impacts people's lives. Yeah. Do you yeah, wanna, I completely agree. I mean, do you want to elaborate on that? What you mean by that? How it yeah, sure. So I have a, a project that's called on the validity and reliability of music information retrieval experiments. And it's really about how to do machine learning experiments in music information retrieval. And so if you think about it, what is a machine learning experiment? You have some input data, let's say it's some song, some audio songs, let's say you have a sound 1,000 songs from 10 different genres like rock, blues, electronic, jazz, classical music, whatnot. So this is your input data. And for your machine learning system, that's just a bunch of numbers. It's just like a cemetery of numbers. And what you want to have, at the other hand, you have an output of your system that would be, for instance, the genre of every song. So you want to put in the, the audio and the machine learning system should sort of spit out the correct genre. Again, this is just numbers. You code this some, somehow for your machine learning system. And in between sort of this input and output, there's your machine learning system. And it can be something very simple, like a nearest neighbor-based system. It can be your super fancy deep learning thing that has a million of parameters that are also just numbers. And what you do in machine learning, put in numbers here, you want to get to those numbers and you tweak the numbers in between so that they result in the other numbers. So it's really just function approximation. That's all it is, sort of. And the way it's done is you, you have your big data set and you divide it in training and test data. The training data you use to tweak all these numbers, you know, to train all the weights in your neural network so that this mapping from input to output works. And then you need to have a separate test set to, to evaluate in a fair way whether that works. And yeah, sort of that's, that's the basic setup. And you know, one of the things that usually very often go wrong, you, know, you have the data that you used for training and testing, and then I come and bring you a different data set. But it also has audio and it has the same genres. And I bet you, a lot of time, very, very often, your system will totally fail on this sort of what is called out of sample generalization task, because not a lot of people are doing this. And this is because, you know, there, there might be little differences. Your MP3 coder might have worked different. Your wave, you know, your waveforms are a little different. You know, subtle differences trick these machine learning systems. And this is called the validity of, of, a, of an experiment, you know, a valid experiment is an experiment that measures what you actually want to measure. I mean, this sort of sounds circular, but you can ask your question, am I happy that my uh, machine learning system works for my training and test data, or am I claiming this does genre classification for all kinds of Western pop music in general? 
And if you have not sort of clarified this for yourself, you cannot really meaning in a meaningful way talk about the whole experiment. And that's that's so funny because you could actually translate it one to one to architecture. Like of instead of instead of music genres, it's architecture styles. Instead of musicians, it's architects. Anything. It's Anything. Really yeah. And and if. I think it's even worse if we then talk about um, uh, people who are using off-the-shelf uh, uh, models, you know, that are probably implemented in the software without the necessary understanding of how you would um, treat it and without uh, uh, incorporating also an expert, you know. So sometimes uh, uh, I, I think um, it's definitely not coming from you, and I haven't uh, talked to anyone personally, but I read really about, uh, uh, sci not scientists, but really uh, um, people working in the field of constructing these machine learning models, that they were saying our models are working now so good that we don't need any experts anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that's something where I totally agree yeah. with, uh, uh, with you, Arthur, on, on, yeah. on, on how, you, how you treat these models, because uh, it's very complex if you really would like to, to build your own models, and, and there is those tools, but so, so people definitely will go a lot to this off-the-shelf solution, yeah. and that is really problematic if you if you if you if you have uh, not trained or labeled your data sets as well so i yeah. i completely agree i think you're as a as working in the field of music though the difference between architecture is you're very lucky that you don't have to label the data you know? and there's data out there for us it's really there is no database for architecture you know specifically okay. how we started to work on, on 3d meshes I think that is rather uh, rather new uh, um, in uh, field in, in in machine learning. So uh, I think at the, the last years it was almost a three D generation and uh, uh, object generation was also very much focusing on voxels and how they can uh, be trained. But but here it's it's really the first time uh, that we were uh, contributing with someone who just. Uh, made it possible to to work on on 3D meshes and geometries, and although we have we have generated with our students, I think millions of those models. I mean, we are very so lucky for us. We are rather good at at uh, creating a lot and many models in a very short amount of time. But the work is really to sit there a whole summer, like Matthias did this year, and really to to. To, uh, to start to label the mods because that's something that we have to do and, and, and that's that, something that the sort of bring me to the next point that you say you need to label your data yourself because that that is yet another problem of the validity right. of the whole process yeah because right. it, in machine learning this is sort of also uh, known as the ground truth sort of but yes. what is ground truth so like in music uh, the genre of a piece of music is very sort of dubious, you know, is this still techno, is it already house, is this radio, is it already ska, so if you ask different people, you will get different answers. So I actually ran experiments and wrote papers exactly about this, you know, having different people label the same data, what kind of agreement do you get, and this, the level of agreement you get between different people sort of sets an upper ceiling for how high your machine learning system can go, what it can achieve. Because I can sort of perfectly imitate Sandra, but then, you know, I, I will sort of be in disagreement with Matthias and the other way around. And, you know, if I want to be good for both of you, then there's only, you know, the level of agreement between the two of you that I can model. And that's sort of, it, it's a super general problem that even in the expert world of machine learning, it's something, you know, in a way everybody knows about this, but you know, you could sort of shove it to the side because it's it's a very convenient <laughs> truth. <laughs> and hardly anybody has data that has been labeled by multiple annotators and tries, you know, have uh, agreement with the labels. Yeah, I, mean, I completely tried agree with you. I mean, if I may just quickly, Sandra, I completely agree with you. Uh, we're talking here about data bias and basically the 
uh, what we were doing with the database that I labeled, we actually intentionally used that bias. Uh, so basically the idea was really that it's only me labeling it because it was supposed to replicate or provide models that are similar to what I do, but they're not the same. So actually new models out of, of what I create. In that extent, it's a very personal database, so to speak, and it's intentionally subjective. It's not objective at all. I agree with you. A cybernetic <laughs> Matthias. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the funny thing is, I am sort of in extending my work on what is known as inter-rater agreement, you know, the agreement between different raters in this labeling music databases. I also looked into how people um, uh, agree with themselves if they look at the same data at a different point in time. And of course, that also changes. And the level of agreement with yourself is also not perfect. And what this all boils down to that if in machine learning, you, you deal with sort of cultural artifacts and, and the digital humanities, there really is no fixed ground truth. So this is sort of, it's a social process that brings about sort of these annotations. They change over time. They're not the same. It, it's sort of a fluid sort of situation. Of course. Yeah. If you think about music, but of course it's the same for architecture. Like the three of us, we've known each other since at least since the early nineties. And, you know, we know each other also through music and through listening to techno music. And, you know, back then techno music was so new and it was such a revolution. And, you know, and you're now living close to Detroit. And I think you, you visited some of the, the, the big heroes from, from, the, from the early techno area. But if you listen to the same music now, you cannot go back to that moment in time when you first heard it. It's com something completely different in your head. It's a different piece of music. So a cultural artifact, it's not a physical fact. It's sort of, it's something that, that comes about in your brain through how you perceive that piece of music or that piece of architecture. And that changes with, have you seen it for the first time? What other things have you seen in between? Now it's 20 years later and it has a whole different meaning if somebody puts out a, a piece of techno music that sounds exactly like the music in 1990s, it's not revolutionary. It's it's a retro act or what's not. Nostalgic, yeah. Nostalgic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a completely different meaning now. And this holds for any kind of cultural artifact, I would say. And for data in general, of course, if you're measuring something from a combustion engine, you know, the, the, you don't really have that problem, but you know, the more human perception is involved, the more, the bigger this problem sort of gets. Absolutely. So, so if, if uh, uh, machine learning is nothing but uh, glorified curve fitting, yes. then, <laughs> then, uh, then actually the, the curves are, to, to, are changing all the time. You know, so. And yes. so, Mike, so, so my question, I, actually, I wanted to, to, to pose this question probably at the end of a talk, but, but here now, uh, and do you think a, a learning rate of 1.0 is something that you want to achieve, or is it a failure in itself? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think to sort because of... I, 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 I was just going through one of the uh, um, of, uh, data bot site where they had a lot of of uh, systems, you know, of uh, small algorithms that obviously, and some of them really had a learning rate of 1.0. And I was like, hmm, that sounds the most dubious to me, you know, so that seems to be the, the something I would question the most and, and think if this is the one thing that you're actually aiming for. You know, you aim, but you should not achieve it probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's, these problems come more and more into focus now that AI systems are really out there in the real world interacting with people. It's something very different if, you know, you're a PhD student, you have the idea that you, I don't know, want to classify architectural models, you find out there's no data set, you set up the data set for yourself, you create the annotations, you train some machine learning model, you show you're at 95%. Everybody's happy and, you know, 
your PhD is done, but it's something very, very different if this goes into a product or some, some artifact that's out there in the world and is faced with different people using this machinery and the things changing over time and, and all these things. So, Yeah, I mean, the best example, of course, is how good or bad you have the feeling you're captured as a person when you, have, uh, when you look at through your Amazon recommendation systems, for example. I think that's the most obvious for people as a real life example. And I must say, uh, I obviously I am one of those persons who has not much data out there uh, for myself. So, so for the <laughs> for those for those systems, it's really hard to capture me. So <laughs> you wouldn't uh, uh, you would be surprised of uh, what these recommender systems recommend because yeah. actually it's nothing that's that's close to me, but of course yes yeah, she, uh, she, she she even lets me order her stuff on amazon on my account and then <laughs> only she spoils your profile <laughs> yeah I, I get some weird recommendations yeah <laughs> exactly so i i think we are we're making some funny creatures out there which is also great i think which which talks a lot about diversity and and the bias you know that we generate is probably it's probably much more uh uh funky than we than we think it is that you can make it a bit more absurd so it's a bit yeah. harder for them to get what what's really up but but I, I i feel it really feel strongly bad for for the younger generation as they are living more and more online specifically in these times so they have no really social context where they can meet meet outside of of digital systems so it's really hard for them to get together and have a communication. So I think it's really something that we did when we met at uh, at, at, at the music uh, events and, and this um, environment. Mm. That was something where we can could be really creative. <laughs> no. And and I'm 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 how can we have what, what is your thought about how could we employ AI technologies really something as an extension to what we do? You know, so 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 in in a very positive and utopian way rather than the dystopic view that is very easy to 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 lay out so is there yeah. anything where you think that could really improve well i mean there's uh there's a lot of applications that are very positive just thinking about the medical field um uh, having uh, software quickly scan through your uh, x-rays and finding out you know whether you're susceptible for cancer or helping finding cures and all these things i think there are a lot of very positive examples also out there but of course yeah there's there's all these other dystopian kind of things but very often the people you know, they think robots and they're going to rule the world and this is their dystopian view. But the real <laughs> dystopia is that your mobile phone is always with you and everybody tracks you all the time. And probably at your bank, they already have a very crappy machine learning system that tells them not to give you a credit <laughs> and you will never know. And all these <laughs> kind of things that run somewhere in the background. <laughs> and yeah, but yeah. Um, I'm also working, so besides this uh, dark side of machine learning project, I also have a arts-based research project, which mm -hmm. is sort of a more, well, hopefully a more positive kind of out view on, on, on AI. It's called Dust and Data, the Art of Curating in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, where together with a, a group of, of, of curators and uh, exhibition architects actually we try to find out how AI and machine learning can help in curating museum exhibitions and it but it, it it neatly works together with sort of this dark side of machine learning project because in in sort of thinking about what art is for instance we work together with the Belvedere which is sort of the main museum in, in Vienna that has, well, at least for, for uh, uh, artworks of Austrian artists. So it has the Klimt and the Schiele and, you know, why, why, why all the tourists go there. <laughs> and, you know, in thinking about how to sort of 
analyze uh, these images, the first impulse you would have is you, you, you need some kind of image recognition because you want to find out what is in the image. I mean, there are images after all, but if you think about it, it's actually not very interesting what is in the image because think about the Mona Lisa, what is it? It's a portrait of a young woman, but this, I mean, this is what a machine learning system will tell you, but this is, it totally misses the point completely. I mean, 100%. So we, what we're doing for the Belvedere is we take a very radical approach and we're not looking at the images at all. We are totally ignoring them and we're only analyzing text about the images, keywords that have been given to the images in the hope to sort of catch the semantics and the meaning sort of of, of, of these uh, pieces of art. And this is sort of thinking about, you know, what a cultural artifact is, how would you annotate this? You wouldn't annotate this saying there's a lady and in the background there's some hills and, you know, and she's smiling. Ta -da, I knew that before, but this is really not what, what it is about, so. Yeah, I can imagine that they can create some really interesting results. I, I remember, I think there's there's a portrait of Gustav Klimt uh, from, it's the portrait of uh, Zuckerkandl, I think. And I would be curious to see what the AI makes out of the title, Portrait of Miss Zuckerkandl. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I don't know if, if, I, um, um, if I can share my screen. I mean, you, we were, Matthias was just asking, he was sort of curious what, what AI systems would be able to get out of some of these uh, pieces of, 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 of art. And what I did here is I took sort of a more or less off the shelf uh, AI tool called DenseCap. And I think Sandra, you told me this is, uh, has been done by some of the professors in Michigan, you, you, you guys work together. Actually, yes, it's, it's uh, uh, Justin uh, Johnson's uh, 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 product, I, I, I guess, because it's, uh, <laughs> so I, I have no personal confirmation from him, but I can ask him. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, so this is, is sort of a tool that has been trained with uh, tens of thousands of photographs and that have been closed captioned. So there's, is it, you know, they, they, they really annotated what you can see in all these pictures. And now you can upload a different photograph and it will then tell you what it thinks it sees in this picture. And for this photograph of these two dogs, it works very well. You know, there's something like the dog's tail is white, the front leg of a dog, a leaf in the ground. You know, most of these labels are sort of correct. I mean, it misses some of them, but you know, this is what it, the machine learning system has been trained for and it works. But if I sort of take this picture here, it is called Caesar at the Rubicon. It's a picture of a dog looking at a sausage and it's still drawn in a very realistic style. You know, some of the labels are still correct, but then it misses a lot of the others. So it says the bed is white, the curtain is white, the dog is on the bed, but it still gets it that there's a dog and a sausage. So it's sort of half and half right. But if you go to something that is more abstract, like this um, Gustav Klimt picture, the kiss, which is the, the most famous picture in the museum. It actually is so famous. If you enter the museum, there is a sign telling you where this picture is. If you don't want to lose time with all the other pictures. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, for 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 this picture, so here, of course, it, it it sort of totally fails because this is too abstract and this is like none of the photographs it has seen. So it then says the wall is made of bricks. It gets the flowers down here. For this, it says that the hat is the hat is on the man's head. So it it, it sort of uh, uh, confuses the hair of the male. It it doesn't get that there's a female face. It actually doesn't get it that it's an embrace and that it's a kiss, but that is sort of okay. It has not been trained for this and you know it's understandable, but it's, it's a principal problem that a lot of the image recognition um, uh, uh, tools have been trained on photos and totally fail if 
the art gets a little more abstract. But there's, you know, people are actually working on this and they would achieve better results on this. But even if my point here is that, that this really is not interesting because for instance, in this picture, it's a dog looking at a sausage, but what the important thing is actually the title of the picture. It is Caesar at the Rubicon. So it, 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 it hints at a historical fact that Caesar the Roman emperor was standing in front of the river Rubicon and by crossing this river with his army, which he was not allowed to do, he rebelled against the Roman Senate and basically this started his ascent to dictatorship and it is now sort of a proverbial point of no return. And this is sort of the dilemma this dog here is facing by looking at the sausage. It's a point of no return if he grabs the sausage and all of this is not in the picture. It's really, it, it, it's not really important to analyze the visual content of the picture. It has all these cultural connotations to it, the title and everything else. So what we do is actually for this project, look at keywords that exist for the whole online database of, uh, uh, of the Belvedere and what we did, for instance, is where do I have that? Yeah, we started, you probably noticed this project called X Degrees of Separation by Google Arts and Culture. It's, it's uh, uh, what they're doing is they're saying they're exploring the hidden path through culture by analyzing visual features. So what, what their programs are doing is you start off here with this statue of an angel and you want to go over here to this drawing of a glass jar and then you know they visually sort of interpolate and by object recognition slowly sort of fade over and but for us our project is about how AI can help curating in a museum context and nobody curates like this I mean this is a very nice and impressive visual gadget but you don't curate by what the things look like, you curate by what the meaning is behind it. And so what we did is, if I wanna scroll over here, um, we tried to sort of do the same start with one piece of art. This here is a statue and the keywords for this is resurrection and Christ. And we wanna go over here to this painting where the keywords are angel, air, martyrdom, suffering, failure, death, and Andreas. So it's uh, the Holy Saint Andreas being tortured to death. It, it's almost Christmas. So it's, it's sort of, it's, it's, I think it's a fitting example, <laughs> but what we can do. So we never looked actually at the visuals here. We only analyzed these sort of uh, uh, um, keywords and by using something that calls a word embedding, so it's a large machine learning model that has been trained by, uh, by millions of texts from Wikipedia and by something that is called the common crawl, where you just crawl half of the internet and then you analyze all these texts and find out what uh, words are being used together and what words have sort of a similar meaning. And in doing this, I can now put numbers to these keywords and work with this. And in going over here, from here, from Resurrection Christ to over here, I first go to something that's a relief that is, uh, uh, has the keyword Christ. In the middle, there's an oil painting that has, is about death and skeleton. So we are already going over to the more grim side of martyrdom. And then this year I find very interesting, it's an etching of vultures because vultures you know, have something to do with death but also with air and angels because angels fly and vultures fly. And so this is how, how our sort of, how we can sort of uh, fill in the spaces between different pictures in, in an exhibition by analyzing sort of the semantic context. And we did this only for these keywords, but you could also analyze much more text about the pictures and try to understand with a machine what the meaning of this piece of art is.
Uh, so, so just that I'm, I, I'm sure you, uh, the, the images that we see here, they're just to help us understand the workflow. Yes. The so, machine so, has not seen the, the image. <laughs> at all, right, okay. Yeah. So, so it's really your project is really something that I could call probably from narrative to semiotics or? Yeah, it's about mm -hmm. early on, we sort of decided that on the one hand, image recognition for art that is not realistically drawn does not work very well. And also it's not very interesting because the interesting thing about a work of art is its meaning, the semantics behind it. And they're only to a very small extent in, in the visual, what you see, so. Yeah, but you I think you mentioned one specific problem which I think is super interesting, which is on the one side, you, you can actually assess through image segmentation certain semantic information in an image, but it's not possible to read out from that uh, image the cultural connotation. And I think that's, that's a thing like a really interesting problem. For, for me, that's also very interesting. Have, have you had, uh, 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 that's a super interesting uh, pro uh, project or a ser series or sequence of projects. Have you ever thought about the, uh, uh, the uh, going through a PhD probably on one of those images, because I think uh, most of, of uh, students uh, in, in art uh, would at the end would have uh, either their thesis or the PhD project about one specific piece of art. And there is a lot of information also yeah. within this PhD you ever consider. We have not done this. As you have the problem in, in architecture to get a good database, we have the same problem here. So what we have here is um, the Belvedere has about four or 5,000 pictures online, works of art with some meta information and a keyword system. And that's what we're working with. Mm -hmm. It's much harder to sort of piece together additional texts about uh, about yeah. these works of art. What, what we will probably try and start doing is just access the Wikipedia articles about these mm -hmm. uh, paintings because most of them, almost all of them are very famous and have uh, Wikipedia uh, entrances. And there's a lot of more information there, for instance, is something you could try. Yeah, because uh, I mean, I, I really uh, uh, would, uh, after your studies have been, you know, so, let's assume that your studies would have come to a conclusion, you know, and you would have uh, uh, some examples of this, how you would, how they would actually narrate uh, culture and, and, and a social context into a painting. It's still, the painting is everything, you know, so it's still just about this painting, you know, and I really, uh, I love the approach that you avoid it, but then at the end, I think you, for me, it would be interesting to see how it would be connected again to the image, you know, can- Yeah, yeah, of course. And there and, and, are- And reconstructing uh, an, an, a, a, more, a more informed version of- There are sort of uh, more advanced machine learning models that sort of together embed the visual and the textual information. You can sort of map it to one joint latent space and then you could get sort of at a semantic concept, but still then get at the pictures that visually look the same. So you could have sort of best of both worlds if you want to have that. So true, yeah. Uh, 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 there was a uh, sorry, there was a point pretty much at the beginning of the conversation where you said that you were interested into the let's say the failures of neural networks, and we could show you a lot of them in the work we're doing. <laughs> Uh, uh, but uh, more importantly, and I think that's the question where I'm going for is, uh, I think, or at least like a comment from our side is that we sometimes use these processes uh, in a reversed flow of information so that instead of analyzing the image, it actually produces an image. So for example, if you take the results of your, uh, of your chain of words that you have there, you can basically also use that information to generate an image at the end. And that's something where I'm really, really curious and, and about because it's, it, there's like this whole set of questions that come up when you start doing these sort of things, like it's things like agency, you know, authorship, uh, yeah, sensibilities, what is being generated here. And, and that's where it's become, uh, as a designer for me, really interesting to interrogate that field uh, of possibilities because it's, 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 
uh, it's outside our complete control. And actually, I, I, I appreciate that, that loss of control. Because I think that's something where really creative, interesting new things can happen. When we have everything under control, that's I think where, where it bec could become potentially boring. It's like with music. If you have a, a, a recipe of music that you repeat over and over again, nothing new will happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's um, we are sort of facing the same questions in our dust and data project also. So we're not producing works of art, but you know, producing a curatorial narrative about art is an art in itself. So and of course, there the curators, some of them are frightened, and you know, you cannot do this. You're taking away our 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 expertise, and you know, it is the same sort of bag of questions who is the agent here is it the machine alone i would say no that doesn't make any sense it's always the combination of the human and the machine because you sandra and matthias if you have your machinery create architecture it's always you that has to decide whether it's interesting or not the the, the machine learning algorithm doesn't notice because it you know it just can't so it, it, it doesn't can, have a concept of it. Yeah, it, it can be an interesting tool for you and, and help your thinking process. But at the end, it's always a human that decides, is this a good architectural idea? Is this a good curatorial narrative? Is this a good painting, a good piece of music or whatnot? And yeah. I completely agree. Yeah, and if, if we were thinking alike, I think we had last year a course um, on architecture uh, in collaboration mm -hmm. with the museum here in Ann Arbor, right? And there, were, there was the same question. They were asking basically everyone on campus, like different faculties to work with their artworks and come up with something. And they had this questionnaire. This questionnaire was like, with, with which piece of art would you like to work? And they just put in there everything. Because basically it's the same thing. You take the database of images and you, you can do something with that. And one of our students actually created an artificial curator. Yeah, in that he, he took a very specific French curator from the last century who wrote a book about rule sets of curating and just put that rule set into the neural network. Okay. Yeah? And it actually created results which were quite intriguing. I'm not sure if it's good or, or totally outdated in terms of the concept of curating, but it was interesting. Yeah, we thought about that also. Sort of, uh, can we, you know, if you have you know, like a famous curator, like, I don't know, Obrist or somebody, you know, and, and, and you would sort of track all the sort of everything he has ever done and know what his choices would have been. And then you know what his actual choice was. And then you sort of try to model if, if, if this person is consistent and can, can I sort of replicate this? It's, yeah, it's a fun game, but yeah. I don't know what 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 they would think. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure they would like that too much, but yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's one thing that a lot of this AI and creativity stuff, it's always just sort of a remix, a style copy of things that you feed into the machine, and the machine itself does not have the power and understanding to actually grasp that it has done something that is out of the box, so to say. It, it would not, I yes. mean, if you go back to the techno example, so before techno music, it was basically, you know, the popular music was rock music. And I don't think that if you would have fed a neural network with all the music before from, you know, from Europe and North America, blues, rock and roll and so forth, it would not have been able to bring about techno and even it, if it would have been able to, you know, uh, uh, produce a techno track as an accident, it would not have known that this is something interesting. It would have taken us to listen to it and be like, wow, what is this? This is so cool. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, can the AI recognize, you know, if we have these scatter plots that the that the one dot on the outskirt, you know, is the one interesting. <laughs> and the one not it, I think it would be able to to automatically know that it's an outlier, but it wouldn't but be able to know exactly. that it's an interesting it's a, outlier. That's it's the a whole good, point here. Yeah, so 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 how does it recognize that the outlier is a good one or a bad one, you know? So exactly so. and it can't do that because it doesn't <laughs> know and there's no way you can 
teach this. It would yeah. need absolute human-like intelligence. It would need to share the world with us, understand everything to being able to do this. I mean, it's even humans don't understand it. Think back when techno you know, was new, like let's say 1990, most of the parents would say, this is not music. They would not recognize this as, as music. For them, it was just noise. It was absurd that this is supposed to be music and that anybody on a voluntary basis is listening to this. It still is a lot Very of people. Yeah. I know when we, we uh, I remember <laughs> yeah. the time going to Merzbau, you know, <laughs> the concert. So, okay. so, so. <laughs> well, it is Be noise. because noise was a part of it, you know, that the, yeah. actually, uh, actually, the, the, that it just was playing so loud was part of the concept. It could not be Merzba without a noise level, you know, at over 120 decibels. It's just not possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have to find a mathematician who actually is able to find something, you know, that get, get, get all this com complex and interesting uh, uh, data is approaches to, to yeah. how you create as an individual or as a as a group into into this scenario right but at some point we have to because we are we are so engaged with those those tools we have to enable them you know we have to help them to grow and mature and i'm very thankful that arthur you're one of those who <laughs> who have constantly contributed to this field so <laughs> thank you so much and I, I think we're, we're, I think uh, the good thing is we're not at the end of our conversation. And I have the feeling I would love to talk and chat uh, with you in the future many more times. And, yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> and you ask me again in a year, I might do something completely different. <laughs> right, right. We might probably still doing the same. <laughs> Now that I'm sort of tenured, hello. <laughs> 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 and your rules <laughs> okay well thank you very much okay thank you so much for uh talking to us hope to see thank you, you very soon. bye, bye. <laughs>